Just to talk a little bit about what we've been doing recently. On March, late like March, we had like a large uh, panel. Yeah, I'm to check this now. There's almost 100 people yeah. uh, together outside. So this was the kickoff of our activities. Recently, we had uh, Chad Anderson from the Space Angels Network. We had uh, another event talking about microsatellites, nanosatellites. We had uh, an event with uh, Astro, um, Aerospikes, which is a new engine, new generation of uh, rocket engines. So, uh, if you guys have any suggestion of events or speakers for our uh, space talk, please also feel free to to make suggestions. We'd we'll be happy to put them in our schedule. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that's just that's for, Michael. for Michael because he's done such a oh yeah good no. job and yeah, so anyway, he, miss it. And so he just up. went to the door to see if anybody could make it. Absolutely. And uh, he's gonna also set up the equipment. So the idea is that um, we try to make information as much uh, available as possible. So if, if it's okay for you, we'd like to record it and then uh, put it on where if it's okay. If not, what would happen in the past? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. More than Excellent. Yeah. I'm pretty good because in the we had in fact like some part of the world still under development, so people uh, just prefer to keep uh, the, the discussion more private. But we appreciate it. You know? We also agree that the more information is spread out, the better. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more it's more often problem to get the information out and leave it to more than the other one. And by the way, before we start, we wish to uh, learn about New Space Barcelona. So it's in a you guys in Spain are also doing something similar to what you've been doing. Are you involved with them? Um, I, I, they organized the talk at the Barcelona Comic Con recently. And so there were a bunch of interesting people, like one of the guys that, an astrophysicist from Ukraine that checks out the, the Big Bang Theory uh, script. So that is correct. <laughs> and so and he was one of the speakers, and, uh, and they invited me as well. And so, so I mean, that's how I learn about them. And uh, yeah, there's a there's a little community of people that think that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys are Gold Torres. Is a, I can put you in touch with them. Or maybe you are. Or, yeah, they tweeted this event because they don't know. Because there's a fellow Spaniard that coming here. Yeah, this is uh, this is becoming mainstream mm -hmm. after so many years. <laughs> <laughs> And so they're doing mostly space. Uh, they they like yeah they they're doing uh, things like Yuri Night and conferences. Okay. This is the thing that, that we said that we said uh, a few days ago. Now this was a set that Mike uh, learned about that we're talking yeah, about yeah. a new space uh, Barcelona. Yeah, yeah. A new yeah. space uh, PCD or whatever. GCM or something. Like that. Yeah. Yeah, they have a big Yeah, they did that. They are organizing something with Visa, I think, uh, some challenge how to use Galileo or something. Yeah. Absolutely. Mike, shall we set up the equipment and let's start? Yeah, we're streaming. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Oh, we're streaming. Yeah, it's just that I'm streaming. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you are. Yeah, the other face here. So, you. so I'm going to see myself. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's <clears throat> much better. So yeah, I'll I'll move it around as people talk. So. Yeah. Okay, forget the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for the chance to come here, and uh, let me let me start with a video just between uh, Sputnik and Explorer, between the first Soviet satellite and the first American satellite. You may have seen this before, or you may not have. So. Can you hear what it says, my last? Here. In the world, I really you don't have people like that next to you talking anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
blast off in a verified atmosphere, and a hyper air pressure is at a minimum. The data update here will be of signal value, both in the conquest of modern space and in America's development of an intercontinental missile, a height reached by the rocket, an estimated 4,000 miles. Yeah, they, they, there is actually no need to puncture the balloon on the way up, but that's that's how it looks down. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there, there were people that thought, well, we might as well break the problem of putting something in the orbit in two, getting outside of the atmosphere, and then getting the speed that is needed. And they were, and they actually did it uh, back then. Well, it didn't reach orbit, but it reached the extreme altitude, and. And that idea was put on the shelf because it was not the it, it was not meeting the requirements of the customer. But who do you think the customer was back then? Government. Government. And what did they want? Mm -hmm. What? A weapon. A weapon. They wanted to destroy Russia in twenty minutes. <laughs> so it's not very useful if you need to wait for one hour for the balloon to go up. And it's also not very useful. Uh, you need a humongous balloon to take a nuclear weapon to Russia, because because balloons have sorry nuclear weapons have something called critical mass, so you can't really make them that tiny. They need a certain amount of mass of fissile material. So so then that mass with all the explosives and all the stuff that needs to go around it, it ends up being a multi-ton thing. And then and this balloon. Effect this advantage of getting out of the atmosphere kind of wasn't that useful for very large payloads. It was useful for 50, 100, 200 kilograms, those kinds of payloads. And then it was it was kind of abandoned because other other programs competing for federal funds uh, were capable of sending much bigger payloads. The other requirement was a spy satellite, a satellite that could take pictures and break down film, bring down film of them. Oops. <laughs> I, yeah, and bring down film uh, in capsules. That's how it was done. There was a camera that took pictures, cut the film in chunks, put in a re-entry capsule, and there was just a few of them, and they were brought back down and, and captured in there. And, and that's how they, they took pictures of the of the places where they were making the the you know the, the shipyards and all these things that we're very interested in. So right now we are seeing a, a huge explosion of uh, well, explosion is not a good word for pockets, but a huge increase in the in the um, in the interest. I might even say a trend in microsatellites. You see, uh, microsatellites have been shown to do, be able to do lots of amazing things. We got our friends from Planet Labs that can take four meter resolution pictures with a five kilogram to unit satellite. There's been a promise of microsatellites for a really long time. And actually, there's been microsatellites for a long time. But now, with the miniaturization of, of electronics, they become really capable. And, but in order for them to really solve problems, that people have and companies have, they need to work as a network. They need to be in a mesh so that they can guarantee that, for instance, they can monitor a pipeline. Okay, their pipeline theft is a problem that might be solved from space. There's people stealing oil from the pipelines, and when and when pipeline owners they put cameras and sensors on the pipeline, they, they get broken. Even the drones, they're shut down. So the, the, only, the only solution is probably <coughs> up from space. That's just part of the solution. You need reconnaissance and you need re um, enforcement. But, but reconnaissance is not yet working. And this is a multi-billion dollar problem that needs to be solved from up there. But the only way to monitor the pipeline all the time is if you have a constellation of satellites. If the satellites are put in the right places, and you don't need huge satellites. You just but you need many of them, and you need to put them in the right places. And that's the problem that is not solved. You see, for traditional multi ton satellites, SpaceX is the gaming town. They solve that problem. They're doing a tremendous job. 
Um, until recently, it was Ariane 5, which was the biggest uh, share in the market. Uh, in Europe, where it's taken a while for us to catch up in the large satellite arena. But, but there's, it's a solved problem. Um, and, um, and, 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 and there's quite a few launchers. There's the Proton, there's this, uh, the Ariane 5, as I said, and, 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 and Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy that's coming along. But for those micro satellites and nano satellites, there really is a, a good solution. You know, the, for instance, let me give you an example. I was saying Planet Labs. You know how Planet Labs is launching most of their satellites? They send them up on the Dragon, which hooks itself to the space station, and an astronaut, a human being in orbit, goes, opens the door, gets the satellites, gets it to the Japanese module. That has a hatch, they open the hatch and throw them out. Why? They take beautiful pictures of the satellites flying away. They call them the dots. It's beautiful. But of course, they're not paying for that. Everybody's paying for that because to have a human being doing all these things in orbit, when you could just send it and put it inside a huge satellite that itself needs to come back down, I mean, you think of the efficiency of that process, there is no efficiency at all. Of course, NASA and the Japanese Space Agency like to do that because it makes them cool, it makes them like they're enabling whatever. But the only thing they're enabling is the test of the satellite because after six months, the satellite is back on Earth. Because that orbit is a really terrible orbit for a small satellite, it just decays back down very quickly. So you need to send them higher and you need to send them in orbits that make sense for their mission, which in most cases are polar orbits. In a polar orbit, you see the whole Earth. In, in the space station orbit, you just see uh, some latitudes. The, the inclination of the space station is a political compromise between Russia and the US, so that you could access it from, from the Kennedy Space Center and you could access it from Baikonur. But that's why it has that inclination. That's not necessarily the good inclination for most of your commercial projects. So there's, of course, a, a need for these things. And, uh, and you know, you, you got to you've got to wait for about two years to send your satellites up. Like, even if you're piggybacking, even if you are counting on somebody else. And, 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 and the whole thing is, is, is extremely complicated. And, and, and oops, what's going on? Is your, oh, is your battery running out, maybe? No, okay, let me see. My okay, battery's good. Battery's uh, good. Yeah, check the program that you were running. Can I connect server? Uh, tr <coughs> try that button that says reconnect. reconnect. Yeah. Okay. Let me try again. Connect and fail. What's the uh, code again? 3091. You said? 3091. 3091. Mm -hmm. Again. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so this is the problem that we're trying to solve. Okay. And our solution to this problem, we call it Blue Star. Blue Star is a three stage launcher that is designed to is optimized to be launched from above most of the atmosphere. Okay. So it's optimized to, to be launched in vacuum. Um, so this is a graph, I don't want to get too technical, but this is a graph of, of the drag force on a launcher being launched from the ground, you see, and being launched from 20 kilometers. Um, when, you, when you develop a, um, a launcher, there's a concept or a missile, there's a concept called, concept called max Q, you know, ma maximum dynamic pressure. And it's the phase of the flight in which the force the dynamic pressure is stronger. And this is, as you go up, the density goes down, but as you go up, the speed goes up as well. So the effect of the speed and the effect of the density compensate, and there's a maximum somewhere. That is a very critical number. That's gonna dictate how strong your structure has to be, what thermal protection you need on the way up. It's gonna dictate many things. And in a design where you are launching from 20 kilometers, Max Q is no longer a factor. You can design for other things, but not necessarily. Uh, you're not under the um, 
the requirement to, to make it pass, make it through max Q. And then those peaks, sorry? Does max Q correspond to those peaks and the curves? Uh, it's, it's, it's near here, it's not necessarily here, but th this is maximum drag, but, but it's around that, yes. Yeah, this one? Oh, okay. okay. So, and, but what you really want to optimize is cost. That's the most important variable. It's not necessarily max Q or drag or anything. And you know, there are some costs that scale down nicely as you make a, a launcher smaller, like the propellant. Propellant scales down nicely. You need less propellant, you, call, you buy it, whatever propellant, kerosene, methane, whatever you buy, it scales down nicely. Some things scale not that well. One of them is the range cost. That's the cost of using a large chunk of land just for yourself. <laughs> you, you know what this is? Anybody knows what this picture is? This is this is Vandenberg. This is the one of the places that SpaceX launches from. This is in California. So it's a huge amount of land owned by the Air Force. It's very tricky to get there. You go there, and if you launch commercially, you need to pay the Air Force a lot of money because that's everybody wants a ranch by the sea in California. I mean. There is big demand for that, and, and people want to have houses, you know, and villas, and, and swimming pools, and kias, and all these sort of things, and you can't have any of that when you're launching rockets. And it doesn't matter if the rocket is huge or small, the range is still important, because if, if there's an issue with the rocket, it still hits you. So, two or four million dollars for a 60 million launch, it's all right, you can assume that cost. But if you're scaling down, you're trying to go below a certain threshold to enable applications that could otherwise, that otherwise would not be launched. Your range cost starts to be a, a big, big part of, of your breakup of your, of your cost. So some people have been smart and said, hey, we may buy an Airbus or a Lockheed TriStar. <laughs> My friend Antonio Lias, he, he bought a TriStar, a Lockheed TriStar, and launches the Pegasus out of it. And it's less costly than the ranch by California, you might see. But it's still freaking expensive to own an aircraft. Unless you fly a lot, you don't break even on the aircraft. You, this thing is like 60 million euro. You need to spend about 20 more or 30 to reinforce this structure. Of course, this doesn't work. You need to break the tail in two. This would not be controllable. You need to put either uh, two vertical surfaces here or remove this one. Um, otherwise, all the, all the turbulence from this would you wouldn't be able to burn the aircraft. So you need to do a lot of changes on it, so it's gonna be like 100 million anyway. Some people said, oh, if, if I'm gonna spend 100 million, I might as well design my own aircraft. So this is also an artist's conception of uh, another approach to send the microsatellites. This is not flying yet. But this thing here is a launcher that would be taking off from the aircraft. And you see, it's still very pointy because if, if imagine that this had the shape of a pumpkin or a sphere, the aircraft will have trouble flying. So you need it to be very aerodynamic, very pointy to still allow yourself to fly because the aircraft needs that aerodynamic force to fly. <coughs> so where is the alternative? What is our approach? Well, only an aircraft is still very expensive. You know, boats are cheaper. There's more people that own a small boat than people that own a small aircraft. You know? So this is how we intend to do it. Uh, so this is a video from the, my campaign manager sent me. We haven't done this, but it's, it's to show you how it's done. And you can imagine that the capital department for this is a lot less. This is a boat that is moving exactly at the same speed as the wind. Okay. So inflating a balloon vertically is very easy. If you're trying to inflate a balloon on a boat uh, or on, on, the, on the ground, you need to you need to have very low winds. But if the boat is moving exactly at the speed of the wind, then it's like there is no wind, so it looks very straight. You see the balloon it has no no issues with it going all sides. So let me first play. The sound is not that interesting.
So again, that's a pointy rocket. That's what they had. But they, they are, it doesn't have to be. There is no gain in, in being aerodynamic like that. Actually, being aerodynamic makes it much harder for it to be reusable. Because on the way down, it's going to get very hot and it's going to be very difficult to control. So the balloon is reusable? No. Nope. Nothing is reusable until proven reusable. Like, for we don't count on any reusability because nobody's ever reused the balloon. Does it, is it, can I design a reusable balloon with my suppliers? Sure. But I'm not looking for capital to design a reusable balloon because that's more capital. And then, so there you go. The balloon goes up with the rocket, bye bye, and they deep fire. So, yeah, th this concept of launching from a boat is possible. And that boat, to make a super fancy boat with a helipad and, and tanks for the hydrogen, for the, for the methane, for the helium, for the oxygen. It's like a two, 2.5 million euro operation with a nice mission control, a nice antenna on the boat. It's nothing next to the airport, sorry, or the, I mean the, the ranch or the airplane. So the plane was like 100, 200? No. Yeah, like 100, the ranch is around the same. And you launch, launch one, right? uh, one, what we've launched, let me show you what we've launched. We've launched donuts. <laughs> two. <laughs> donuts. Donuts. <laughs> yeah, sorry, no <laughs> okay. Triple stage donuts. But did you not just create uh, inflating a balloon and then the, the wind of a similar size as what we use in the time? So we've been launching from the ground several prototypes. Let, let me show you here a, a video of one of the very close. Of what we launched. Oh, we lost it again. Oh, this is not that reliable. The code change is uh, on a timer, it looks like. So I need to do the whole operation again? Yes, uh, close it out. And this time the code is 3310. Change this every time only. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's all right. So you can write the code. And you say again the code? 3310. Uh, it won't reach, actually. OK. Oh. Okay. Okay, it's not beat up. You see that you remember the first video I showed you, the one from the 50s with the balloon and the crane? So we're doing that here just with color. So and this is us, okay, in Spain. So that's the balloon we want to first play. And it's dropping. Maybe try starting with them. Yeah, let's, let's show it with the iPhone. So you can pass it around that way. Okay. Yeah, I bet it's 5%. <laughs> <laughs> There's always some things. So <laughs> the iPad with the. So. Like, is it ready? Yeah. 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 But usually plays, I don't understand. It's being stubborn. So. Okay, so. Maybe you can show it. Just show Okay. Um, but you're, you're, okay, so you see there? You see the donut there? Yes. Oh. And the balloon is up there. Oh, okay. Yep. So it's gonna take off. It's okay, to go to the 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 yeah. I'm just gonna put it at the end of the flight so you can pass it around to see if it's took off. Is it spinning on time? Uh, yeah, it is, but, but you can pass it on. Look for the sunny horizon. 
just like some more time. So, so I think it's over there. There you go. I look up and you see a balloon. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. very <laughs> So you can pass it around. So it's a dollar, but that dollar, is, that dollar didn't carry for that because there's other applications of sending balloons up. They want to see it. Oh, this may be working now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I can I can move it up. <laughs> so if I look up, I see the balloon and it looks very tiny because all the helium is compressed. So this donut here is not the donut for propellant, it's a donut for people, okay? Because the company has another side of the business which is to send people up so that they can see the view that Felix von Garner had but we thought the need to spend forty million dollars. This is an actual view of the launch. It's a real view, yeah. It's a it's a it's a test flight and from an air force base. The satellite that was launched is it in orbit? No, no. This didn't this launch a satellite. This was a test flight of our capability to launch stuff up there awesome. with with cranes. We still haven't done it with a boat, but it's a, they tell me it's easier. But, <clears throat> but we had insurance to launch from this specific base. Back and where then. are you launching from? Uh, now we're launching from Cordoba. This was launched from Leon in, in Spain. So this is, is going it a military base? It's, it was, it's a military base, yeah. Cordoba is civilian. And Cordoba has much better wings, actually. And the launchers, uh, I mean, the launcher is going to launch out of the Atlantic, out of a port of the Canary Islands. So you actually, the ignition takes place above controlled airspace in international waters. So there is no ignition of any rocket on any country's jurisdiction. It's happening anyway above controller space, and that's where you ignite. So on the way up, it's just a balloon, and we already do that. We already have all the all the permits to do the balloon flights. Sorry, what is the donut exactly? Is it just a weight? Like this donut is a pressure vessel. It's a half-scale version of a vehicle that will take four passengers and two pilots. Um, which is in development. Um, this one is made of aircraft aluminum. The final one will be made of carbon fiber. So now we are like Concord altitude. So there's a patch of the sky that is black. And look, the balloon is bigger now because it's expanded a little bit. Like, these are not UFOs. These are just lens flares. <laughs> this is like 18 kilometers right now. Um, this flight got to 32, so we're gonna, yeah, I think we're about 31 now. Let's see the balloon. The balloon tells me the size. Now it's perfectly inflated, so yeah, we're at 31, 32 kilometers. You see the sky is as black as it gets. It's totally black. And to launch satellites, you don't need to get this high. Between 20 and 25 is the optimum. You don't get that much benefit from going higher. Does it go higher? It, it can go higher, yeah, definitely. The Japanese send things to 50 kilometers. But it depends on the application. You will need an, air, an altitude or another altitude. It's like the example of Planet Labs. If you just want to test the satellite work, six, uh, sorry, 400 kilometers is fine. <coughs> you want to make it last long, you need to take it to 600. If you just want to provide telecommunications, like Google is doing, maybe 20 kilometers is fine. If you want to do X-ray astronomy, you want to go as high as possible. So it depends on the application. And and to launch satellites, 2025 is perfect. Yeah. You said it This one will contain people. It contained a robot. It was actually designed for a dog, but then I talked to people that were more sensible. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the times for life are gone. How do they get that done? Um, I'll show you. You want to see how they get back down? Okay, it's off topic, but since the audience has <laughs> it. What's, your, what's the altitude? This is 32 kilometers. What's the, what's the max altitude? The what? The maximum altitude. Yeah, the maximum altitude this flew to was 60, uh, sorry, 32. But in, in terms of your plan. So oh, our plan, plan is 36. The, the uh, for, uh, for the microsatellites? Yeah. Okay, the microsatellites so is going to drop somewhere between 20 and 25. Okay. And then 
put it on the orbit that the client wants. So Some the propulsion to get it to Yes, of course. It will, and I'll show you how it works right now, the propulsion, because it's interesting. But to answer your question how this back comes back down, this is a video. Which, uh, um, okay, of, of, of our, this is a test. We are in a program to develop a power <coughs> for aircraft. If they have an emergency, they would land autonomously on the closest patch of land that is uh, not uh, that is not dangerous. So this is the same parafoil that we are using for that application. So it's an EU funded project and you're going to see how it does a lens flare just before touchdown. So there you go, oh, that's how it lands. So it's an autonomous? It's autonomous, you can also pilot it or you can remote control it. So this is, so, yeah. Oh, so the controller is just, just yeah. There's some servos that can just so yeah. This is this can have several applications. I mean, if you wanted to take a telescope, for instance, many telescopes don't need to go to orbit. They're they're perfectly fine, uh, at just uh, 30 or 40 kilometers, but they're fragile. So you want to take them down in a better, more nicer way than conventional parachutes. So you would take them up, then down that way. So. This is this is how it looks. So you see the rocket is not pointy. It doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. It's been designed so that it's highly controllable and it's highly likely to be reusable. So it goes, you see, at to 250 kilometers, and then the first stage drops down. And you see the first stage looks like a donut again <coughs> with huge nozzles because you're expanding in the vacuum already. Like the nozzles, they are either adapted to expand in sea level or adapted to expand at low pressure. Mm -hmm. So these are, that's why the bells are so big. So then the second stage drops and the last stage puts the satellite in orbit. Right, I have a little model here <coughs> of this, which is super fun now, actually. Mm -hmm. that, but it helps explain things. So prepare. Prepare. Yeah. So that this is it, and and the or the client is here. Okay. This is here. Cube stuff. Well, this is more like a planetary resources <laughs> thing. That's cool. And but you have to think that the fairing that we put is this small, but it doesn't have to be like. You could have a satellite that is, is has some horns and some things uh, coming out or some tennis because um, it doesn't matter. Anyway, you have huge frontal air, but since you are going fast on very thin air, the, the drag is not really an issue. So you most of the launchers that, that are launching from the ground, they have a very, very small ferry like this one, and you gotta make your satellite fit into that. And sometimes, uh, you know, especially if you want to have a telescope, what you want is a, is a large volume, so that uh, but not necessarily a lot of mass. Right. So and you can enable. Control. Sorry. Sorry, and that's just the constraint. It's only on the mass, but not the volume or the area. Yeah, the area is, is much larger than you can have. Of course, it has to withstand the vibrational environment, so you can't really have very fragile things. It's probably not the migrate, but the vibrational environment is also nicer because you are not like against the earth. So the first stage is going to drop and you see it's going to come back and it's got some carbon aerogel in front so that the shock wave sp uh, spreads the heat around all this circle. Like if you had a conventional launcher like this one you know, that is coming back from space uh, the shock wave is going to get very close to it and it's going to burn through the material or you're going to have to use a lot of extra propellant and retro rockets. So you, you just stop it down that way and uh, and, and yeah, the, the shock wave it gets super close. But here, the flow thinks that this is like a huge sphere. So the shock wave is much further away. You know, you know, and, and, and this of course, when it falls, you run out of liquid propellant, but there's still some gas propellant. There's still some UH in the tank that, that is going to allow you to steer it on the way down with these engines. 
So controlling something like this is a lot easier than controlling something that is being pushed from the ground. Like if you're not at the right angle, it's extremely easy to change the angle. But if you have something like this that you're putting, pushing it, and it's at the wrong angle, yeah? You were saying? Oh, my friend, I need the link for the YouTube. Uh, just go to our YouTube. Okay. It's there. So if, if you're at the wrong angle, you got to do a whole excursion to reorient yourself like that, and there it goes all your propellant, and you're not going to get to the right altitude of your orbit that you want to do. So, so yeah, this is the first stage. And uh, so I'm saying that this control set this has a lot more um, versatility. Like you don't have to. You're talking about that excursion. Yes. You, that would be less necessary with this. We don't. Yeah. We don't make multi-copter drones with a lot of batteries put in a row and all the all the all the things together, all the all the fans together. It's just how conventional launchers look like. All the energy stuck very high up with high zero gravity. And then, and then all the little, little control at the bottom. So you, if you want to land these things, you need to add fancy stuff, like great things here, or thrusters, or lots of heavy complicated things. Landing that is a piece of cake compared to that. You see, uh, you look at upper stages, the Russian upper stages, they, they often look like that. They have toroidal times, and, and because they are already up in space, so they don't need to. Yeah. What was the thing in the video with the parachute? Is that the first stage? Or is that the thing that was hanging from it? Yeah. That was a dummy mass of six ton. Oh, okay. So that was as if it's never launched and just all got dropped back. Um, we, no, we don't use the parafoil for this. If we needed to, like, we can abort the mission. Like, we can take off from the boat. We see there's a problem on the way up. So we open the valve at the top of the balloon, and the whole thing comes back down softly. There will be no parafoil like that on the launcher. It's just for the people's version. So that's why I said it was a little bit off topic, but since uh, you asked, uh, I wanted to show it. <coughs> so the second stage might be reusable as well. Nobody really knows. I mean, making these things reusable is a total new art. I mean, nobody knows. It's, it's also coming back down in a similar way. The idea is to, we still haven't figured out if we wanted to land on a barge or land on a net. Because the control requirements to follow the net and just be trapped on the net are a lot less than having a precise landing. In any case, we know this is not going to tip to the sides because the center of gravity is way too low for it to happen. So where do we want to launch? This is, this is a picture of the Canary Islands. And it's one last year best picture from NASA. A lot of people know it, I guess, from Spain. Or <laughs> you, know, as, you know, it's like when... There's these unknown people from from the sea row. I remember that there was this guy, yeah, well, that was like nominated for a time person of the year, but yeah, because everybody thought he was <laughs> So going back, the green always comes this way here. So these islands are very interesting because they have extremely high volcanoes. This one and this one are super steep like that. And, and it's a tropical area, so there's not a lot of variation in the weather. And, and the wind comes this way. And these things that you see here are the wakes of that wind. And in these areas, the sea is calm, flat, and the winds are pretty low. So, because this is like, this is acting like a barrier, the volcano is acting like a barrier. So, <laughs> commercial time. Yeah, this is like yeah, American sorry. football, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Like I've got him. I've got him with this. It's a new thing. Show me. Let's see. Uh, so present play is not working. Uh, if we try closing it, maybe, and then uh, I don't know where you, uh, where it downloaded. But yeah. There we go. Yeah. Seven four seven four. Seven four seven four. Yep. Okay. Are we back online? We're back. <laughs> so you you are saying something? You were asking a question? No, I, I, there's a preference thing. Uh, maybe that's a timeout. There's a what? A preference thing. Uh, preferences. Uh, that's okay. We're not gonna. We're probably. We won't adjust it now. Okay. Yeah.
So, so yeah, in, in Spain we, we spend a huge amount of money to put uh, wind power windmills all around. So we've been identifying the places that have high winds and low winds. Actually, one of my investors used to make those things amazing wind maps. So it's a wind map of the Canary Island, and you see that the speed is, is the smallest possible in all these areas. You see here, here, here. But this is the best. Okay. So there, you can position yourself, and, and of course, if in like the northern part has a storm or something, you might you might go to the lower part. You can you can maybe move around a little bit, and so you go where the weather is fine and where the trajectory is going to get you to the to the launch window that you win that you want. So yeah, this is the best uh, for it. And the other thing that is interesting about the Canary Islands is that there is IKEA, there is French school, American school. <laughs> What's going on? No idea. What is the timeout? Do we have access to the timeout? There you go. So yeah, this is I don't know, a graph of how it would look for a mission. Into polar orbit. See, you're still very close to the Earth. Really, at those at 600 kilometers, the Earth is so big. But you see, most of the most of the growth in, in small sat I mean, in satellites is going to come from low Earth orbit. And that a lot of people hear about yeah, space debris. You're going to increase the amount of debris out there. You know, they watch movie Gravity. And the cool thing about low Earth orbit is that it doesn't stay very long. Anything that you put there in a few years is down. It's not like you're reaching higher orbits where it's really going to stay for a long time and it's a problem of sustainability. <coughs> we, we expect that most of the new missions uh, are going to happen in lower orbit because you have low latency, low time, low power to communicate with them because you don't have to communicate with something that is uh, thousands of kilometers away, which is hundreds. It's a big difference, close to the square. And, um, but, but again, we will need lots of things because they move very fast. They, they spin like 16 times a day around the Earth. So you need to have one that's talking to you and then another one that's coming after that one and so on. So this is the performance uh, around 80 kilograms to 600 kilometers as on synchronous orbit. So, it, But if you lower the altitude, you can take a little bit more. And if you reduce the inclination, I mean, this is the toughest orbit. Polar orbit is the toughest one. It's the most difficult one. If you wanted to do a equatorial orbit, you, you can do like 50% more uh, than, than this. And some applications are fine with equatorial orbit. Like if you wanted to send uh, protein samples to make protein crystals and bring them back in a small capsule, which is a promise, something that NASA has been promising for a long time, that's going to be very beneficial. But these crystals, when they grow them in the space station, they, they don't work very well because there's not a pure microgravity environment. There's so guy on a, on a treadmill and on a bike and the whole thing shakes and, and it's a really terrible and only one point is really a microgravity, the rest is not because it's so huge. So there is a like internal gravity in the space station. So so we might actually get at some point the interest of people to grow those crystals up in orbit and bring them back down. And this and they don't they don't need huge amounts, they need grams of it. But they can have like lots of them and that could be a recurrent mission. I mean, there's many missions that can be run by these things, and, uh, and, and and for that mission, what they want is time. They want a few weeks to grow the crystal, and that's it. And they don't care about the inclination. But for others, they do. So, this is the typical pricing. Okay. So, of course, the bigger the rocket is, the less per kilogram that you're going to expect to pay, because it doesn't scale perfectly. But basically, we are going to be able to offer what they are paying now as secondary payloads but being the primary payload, okay? So the, the same amount of money that they're paying to be flown uh, as a backup piggyback thing uh, on a random orbit, being them the, the customer. <coughs> so yeah, this is how it looks. Well, you, you got the model there. Uh, this is a flight, <coughs> this is a, a flight of, of this one part here, okay? See this, this white part here is a tank, 
and it's using a special type of technology that is very lightweight, and so that's that's what you see in that video. And uh, we, this one we flew it out of Cordoba. So this tank is, is actually flexible. It's a balloon on its own. And, and the rigidity comes from the pressure inside it. I worked a lot, many years ago, I worked on the Ariane 5, and, and there I, I saw that the, the five, di five meter diameter tank, hydrogen and oxygen tank, actually needs to be pressurized, otherwise it will fall by its own weight. It's a balloon, but it's a balloon made of aluminum. And aluminum is not the best material to make the structures that are held by pressure. So we've been working with some folks. You probably know Bigelow Aerospace. You've heard about the guy in the, sorry, the, the Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. The, the, they're, I think they're still in orbit. These are the modules that they threw, the scale modules of the space station. Well, they were not built by Bigelow. They were built by the same folks that built this tank for us. They're in Canada, in Red Line. And this is a rocket that we're testing. Okay. So a lot of people say, oh, well, why, why are you making the rocket yourself? There's so many companies that come with rockets. Well, most of them are under ITAR. ITAR is, means International Traffic and Arms Regulation. So it's tricky to get the technology outside of the United States. And to be honest, the rockets that we need for these are incredibly silly. They don't, you see, one of the factors that is very important for, for, um, for the efficiency of a rocket is the specific impulse, okay? This is a, a measure of how how well it uses the propellant or the speed that it gets out. And, and that is a ratio between the pressure here and the pressure here, okay? The pressure inside the engine and the pressure outside. And a lot of people go to great lengths to increase the pressure here in the, in the engine, either making complex turbo pumps or making in, intelligent other alternative solutions like piston pumps, like x cores been doing, and or like or some people are doing electric pumps in New Zealand, rocket lab. But you need, or some people are working on on, yeah, on all, all their alternative ways to, to raise that pressure. Well, the balloon, the beauty of the balloon is that it decreases this pressure. So instead of increasing that one, it decreases this one naturally. So you don't have to have such high chamber pressures to have high efficiency, okay? So, so uh, you, you don't have to have a, a turbo pump. I mean, the turbo pump is something complicated and expensive to develop. Like probably one third of the engineers at, at SpaceX are working on, the, on their turbo pumps. And that's, already, that's, a, that's a cost that you don't have anymore. Is that pressure being so much less because of the altitude? Yeah, exactly. The altitude reduces the pressure, so you can have an economically, well, it's still an effective, what's called a pressure-fed engine. An engine that is just uh, using the vacuum of outside to suck the propellants out of the tank instead of forcing them into the engine. So that kind of engine has a lot less parts. It's basically some electro valves and some cooling pack passages. They can be 3D printed. And, and, and the technology to make them has been around since the 30s, really. It's less advanced than technology for the V2. V2 did have these, these turbo pumps. This is not needed. So this is some, some images of how this would look like. Uh, it wouldn't be on land, by the way. Be see, so this is more eye candy. And then... Um, and something also interesting, the, the engines are all firing at the same time, and they're all being fed by this tank. So there's a lot of pipes that go from this tank to the nozzles of the other engines, and then they get caught by pyrotechnic cutters. They're single-use pyrotechnic valves. So they get caught when this separates. So when this separates, the, this tank and this one are full. So that's more efficient. So at no instance you have, you are pushing a rocket engine that is not alive. So all the engines are helping you. They help you in case there is an engine out kit, engine out situation. The more engines you have, the more you can control. 
And, and, and <coughs> yeah, and you don't push inert stuff. You don't push empty tanks, and you don't push uh, engines that are just not being used, as you would on a conventional stack parallel, I mean, sorry, um, serial one on top of each other. So who else in the team? Well, we've, we're privileged to have a great, uh, great group of, of, of investors and advisors. And, and, and you know, um, I, I would like to mention a couple of them that are, that are American. One is Steven Peterson. He set up NASA's balloon program in McMurdo. Then he set up the Italian balloon program, and then the Norwegian one. And ours is his fourth high altitude balloon program. So I don't know anybody that's more experienced than him in preparing this, uh, these things. And he's, he's pretty happy with the rest of the team. I mean, he hasn't seen in his previous experiences uh, um, the sort of features that, that we have. And then another guy that, that just joined uh, is Michael L.A., Michael Lopez Alegria, who was born in Madrid, but grew up in the States, in Mission Viejo, California. And he's NASA's astronaut that has spent the longest time in space. So, it, it, and also with the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation, the, the group of companies that, that try to, to get policy being more, more beneficial to new space. So, he's done this transition to go from NASA to the private sector to the, to the lobbying group, if you will, of, of new space companies. And now he's helping a few companies, including ourselves. And actually, we're flying uh, together uh, to the Middle East in a couple of days. And that would be very interesting. Uh, I can't say more than that. And also, for instance, we have uh, Jose Maria Yalo, who's a solar space engineer. And uh, he founded a company that right now makes more balloons that are certified to carry people by EASA and the EFA. He was the first external investor because he was the first one that believed that we would be successful at getting people up on these balloons. Initially, we talked about people with him. And he said, yeah, of course, if the regulatory stuff is it's complex, but it's doable. I do it all the time. I launch people on balloon. I, we design new types of balloons, we certify them. And that, of course, scared a lot of initial investors. And then when they saw, well, if this guy is in the business, no statistical video, maybe I won't join him. So we raised 3 million euros so far. And this is what we had to show for it. And we are right now fundraising more. And so that's that's my email, and and I, I would like to say a, a few words also of why we're in Barcelona. This may sound like, what's, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's a really 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 smart thing to do. You know, in in the U.S. there's a certain competition for talent. There's Blue Origin, there's SpaceX, there's good old NASA. That's unless we want to go there, but some still want to, and. And it's a very closed environment. It's very hard to get in. Like, I, I studied at MIT, and you know, it was not possible for graduates to go uh, that were not American. You need to be American. Well, the rest of the world has been watching what SpaceX is doing, and they are desperate to find a place to work where they can do new, new, new space things, and they don't have that much choice. So we get Asians. Europeans, Latin Americans that are sending the CVs are saying, well, it's wonderful. Uh, Spain doesn't have the regular framework of the states in order to hire people. It's a lot easier to bring foreigners. Or we have export control rules, but they are not like either at all. They are a lot more manageable. So uh, we we're discussing with Emiratis, and we can bring Emiratis in the team if needed, so that's easier to raise capital from them. You know, Virgin Galactic was funded exclusively from funds from the UAE. And, and of course, they cannot hire a single Emirati, so that's a bit of a difficult thing for them to manage. Whereas when we talk to the Emiratis, we say, how what percentage of the team do you want to be Emirati? And so that that opens up a whole set of, of, of opportunities. And who doesn't want to live for a few years in Barcelona? <laughs> and you know, here there are champions, and it's difficult to get in, you know, it's, uh, backed by billionaires, so it's pretty tricky. Whereas in Europe, it's it's a blue ocean. There is not many companies like this, so we can become the European Union champion. Not that there is never in the industry a single monopolistic entity, you know, that takes everything. So a lot of people, I don't think that space is going to be that. But historically, in no industry, it happens like that. So. 
probably, I mean, the European Union has a good track record in aerospace. I mean, we've got Airbus, we've got the Iron Fighting, and recently was the most successful commercial launcher. And where are all these people going to work that are maybe upset at the lack of innovation in the conventional programs? Well, they be asked to work for us. So the most important things that, that I think for company are, are the team and its customers. So those are the ones you really have to care for. And, and, and we can have customers from all around the world. If we don't have those kinds of innovation, we have a lot of satellites from China, we have a lot of satellites from Brazil, from Russia, from Europe, from people actually. And we can attract people from anywhere. So that's why I think being this famous is particularly good. And being Barcelona specifically. And if I find someone better, I may move, but I, that's that's the rational view behind. Um, so thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer more questions. Okay. <laughs> What's the time frame between now and execution or the first flight, commercial flight? Okay, well, um, we, we've had commercial flights of just one man, the balloons, so that's the running business on its own. And, uh, and the next step is just going to be building this one and using this as a sounding rock. This could be ready late next year, and we will need at least one year more. Have the whole thing to the first orbital trial. Uh, so that's that's going to be the timeline. Yeah. Are you guys interested in joining in, uh, an accelerator like SMIC? Uh, we are very aware that we need your presence in North America. We, it's the biggest market, there's lots of opportunities, there's the SBIRs, there's lots of things that can be done that are interesting. We still haven't made up our mind where. But we will have to have at least a commercial office, for sure. Um, and but but where I don't I don't know yet. We need a problem. We discuss with some people from different places, uh, like Kentucky with their tango thing and a few other places. But we uh, obviously Silicon Valley is an obvious choice because they have so many new spaces. Perhaps, but we still have made up our mind uh, where that might happen. And. Uh, Right now, it's not yet any budget, but, but it's something that we're very aware of. Probably in Asia as well. Yeah. So, um, well, if you, if you have your launcher, could you potentially just deploy to all those areas? So, could, could, you, uh, could you like deploy from the from the boat from the Atlantic Sea, Pacific Ocean? Could, could this uh, could the launcher do that? Could it? Yeah, you just need a boat that moves at the same speed as the wind, and then you can lift up. So you could potentially service customers in all these areas then? Yeah. Yeah. I mean the logistic cost of taking the boat there may be disincentive. So you, you would want to have a boat already there and and your launcher already there, but other than that here. We 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 will the plan is to start with a boat in the Canary Islands and maybe have a second boat in, in up in the Arctic Circle in Spalard. In hmm. uh, because uh, that's that's really good for or over a little bit, there's some benefit there, and we have already uh, some persons there, we've done some things there in this Cool. Yeah. So about your customers, it seems like there's sort of two parts, there's non-human and there's human cargo take up into lower orbit. Okay, so how do you think that's going to evolve at the time? What, what are you going to start with and how is that going to change? So from, you know, doing small steps, things like that's actually taking people up and down. Okay, let me explain. Um, the, the focus of the business right now is on the launcher side. We're still taking reservations, and we hope to take more reservations of human flights up there. But what I think is going to happen is that at some point there's going to be a big customer that is going to say, hey, I would like you to send a person or this celebrity or, or a prince or something like that up, and now um, don't worry about it. So that's how the human part is going to be And it's, we do some work on it, we have, but it's pretty hard, we don't have a scale version of it. But that's not really where we're deploying the capital that we're raising right now. We're deploying it on this because there is a window of opportunity and there's a huge demand that we're not yet seeing from the human side. For the, one thing that could work for the human side is, you know, um, 
in the European Space Agency and the European Commission are finally changing a little bit their behavior and becoming more like NASA with costs and so on. So far, it's been, I don't know, that the money is forever, so you know, go away. But now it's changing. And we've gotten several grants, and we expect to get more grants. And the, in, one of them is to make a laboratory to send astronauts to train up there and to do experiments on their own game. But you see, European astronauts get to fly very little. They have to all share the studies. So most of these astronauts don't get a lot of flight time. And, and that's not cool. And if they went up on the moon, of course, it's not the same thing as being in orbit. But a lot of things can be done up there, and it's a lot more representative than sitting in office, which is what they do. Um, so that, that, the phase one is approved. We get the phase two. That would mean that we would start sending people, um, but professional astronauts from Europe, not necessarily tourists. And that's a natural step. I, I don't think you can go from flying one tourist every two or three years, which is what's going on right now, in the, in the Russian system, to flying 300 tourists a year, which is what a lot of these business plans are saying. I mean, how, how does the transition happen? There must be points in between. There must be one year in which there's 15 people. Are these 15 tourists? Then it doesn't mean great even. So these 15 are probably professionals. These 15 are probably astronauts from nations. You can see most nations don't have the masters. So, so is there a market there? For sure. And um, but of course, those flights would be experimental. People would be highly trained. They would be wearing this kind of pressure suits. And that's a different kind of mission from you don't have to do it. Yeah, right. It's, it doesn't use this technology just to do in part, but does the astronauts. Well, there is a lot of back office stuff that is the same. You need a computer that doesn't crash. Sure. You need uh, you need a server to predict the trajectory. You need uh, the capability to make efficient toroidal kind of shapes uh, have pressure inside. This pressure is here, which is several other ones one bar, but it's still uh, the same kind of office per stage part is the same. same. Well, but one would be launching from a boat and the other one would be launching from a crane. Can you launch a balloon system from a tall building? You, could you launch a balloon from a tall building? Uh, you could. You could. Um, it would would be scary, but <laughs> there's a <laughs> with yeah, the NASA has a sort of told how to launch some types of payloads off. But yeah, we don't wanna be too inventive in the so we wanna use stuff that we really know how that works and, and when it fails how it fails so we can have the redundancy, you know. Yeah. How fast does it travel What? Um, the balloons, they, they travel a few meters per second, not very fast. So you can neglect the effect of the speed on the calculations for the so <laughs> The speed of the balloon is nothing. Are you trying to make it faster? No. We, we are not, what, what, for us, we have zero interest in controlling the balloon. We have interest in predicting the trajectory of the balloon. Predicting the trajectory is really what, what's important. So, so then we know where to you have to be so that when the balloon reaches the right altitude, it is where it should be uh, to, to unite the rocket. I have an idea. So sure. what if uh, you guys, of course this is going to take a while, but we need to be sterile in order to do this. Uh, where if you launch one of the balloons from a rocket into another planet, let's say um, Pluto to, you know, take pictures? Uh, to, to send this uh, for interplanetary mission? Yes. Yeah. Um, the, the, the delta V, the, the energy requirement to reach all the planets is pretty significant. So the only way you could do something like that would be using electric propulsion. So what you would do is you would take to the lowest orbit that you can, the maximum of 150 kilograms, of which two-thirds would be propellant, like xenon gas, and a lot of solar powers and solar power, and then you would have a, a thruster that is uh, accelerating that xenon gas using energy from the solar panels. And it would go in a spiral from the lower orbit up into, say, the moon, for instance. But going further than the moon is tricky. And we, we had a customer ask for that for the moon missions, and they say, well, you need to have a pretty fancy micro satellite with a lot of electrical power. 
which is doable, but I don't think it's being done for these kind of masses. So maybe for interplanetary missions, uh, this is not the optimal configuration. You probably need a bigger rocket. Yeah. Getting back to the question about the customers. So on the satellite end of things, who do you anticipate as your customers, and are there enough to make uh, you know, to have a revenue, a larger revenue producing, yeah, consistent customer base? That's a great point. Um, if it was going to be just the typical customers that they've been until now, like universities and things like that, it wouldn't work very well. But there's folks that are raising significant amounts of capital, like for instance, Planet Labs, and they don't have a, they haven't cracked the problem. Their satellites not lasting long enough, they are not aware of it. So people like Planet Labs could be customers. Of course, we could be launching maybe 15 or 16 satellites at a time for them. People like Skybox, people like Dahlia, Client space. All these we have uh, around in letters of intent, which of course are very nice, but they're not binding. We have around 200 million euro. With that, when we did that with our website, just from word of mouth, and they're signed by CEOs of companies. So there is really a demand for these things. Um, we'd be surprised if there wasn't. But the, the cool thing about this, and going back to the discussion about the airplane and the ranch by the sea and the balloon of the boat. Even if there is no demand that I expected, we can still keep the company alive because we don't have the same capital requirements as these folks that need to design a turbo pump, buy an airplane, or design a turbo pump and buy a ramp. You know? So <laughs> it's a, with a couple of launches a year, we could probably sustain the company. Of course, that's not what we're aiming for, but, but we have very little requirements in that respect. Say I'd like to launch balloon. Very soon, or as we heard today. How do I do it? Let's say, hey guys, can you want to come in? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. We can be ready very quickly. And uh, you, you fill out a form with your requirements, your power requirements, how long you need to be, what altitude, what's the cost? Um, it, well, it uh, depends on the payload. But of course, if you're going to launch less than three kilograms, I recommend that you leave yourself. Because it's so easy. So it keeps that. So I'll do a CubeSat. It's just, just a CubeSat. Yeah. Okay, there's several ways. I mean, a CubeSat, you can do it yourself with a weather balloon. And, but if you don't want to do it, we can just put it, uh, we'll, we'll charge it a little. Yeah, we'll have to see exactly. But we will put it in the flight train between the payload and the balloon. And and, uh, and and just that uh, you be one of many using that flight, so so that's uh, we can do right share things. Would that be a CubeSat dedicated mission, or would that be just you filling up space on, a, on any other mission? Uh, doing a CubeSat dedicated mission just to send one kilogram. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I mean, um, would you be packing a, a payload full of CubeSats, or would you be throwing shunt CubeSat into? Uh, a mission that has ex some extra space, basically. Uh, we will put it in a mission that has some extra space, I think. Okay. Yeah. So we're right now putting together a mission for different groups and we need to test some things on, on, on there. So we might actually. Is there a list? Is there like a few people waiting to go out to the next one? Yeah. Uh, we, it's probably sometime in the summer that we're going to be doing that. We have the balloon already and, and uh, we are, we're signing up customers to go join the. Launch. And how high does it go up again? Uh, anything so between 30. 20 and 40 or 44, depending on the reach. Uh, the Japanese, as I said, they fly to 50, but we don't have access to the films. Okay. The, the, the material that they use, but hmm. I don't, I don't see many customers that really want 50. Hmm. Well, what about the, what about the satellites? What about the um, yeah, this is what I'm trying to explain with this. Um, Um, so, so for instance, polar orbit, you want it to set to reach at 900 kilometers, so you get like 75 kilograms or so. If you, if you want 200 kilometers, you get 80 something. And and there is a factor of like 1.5 if you are not doing the polar. Yeah. Are there any restrictions to set those things in time? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I haven't thought much of that. Um, 
Sartorium? Unobtainium. Unobtainium? That would be good. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't hear of any restrictions. So, it seems that uh, once you guys consolidate the idea, there will be a lot of people who try to copy the model. Oh, there are. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a simple tree. So it's, basically, you're going to have a lot of copycats. So, how are you going to uh, stay competitive with this uh, market? It's cheap, it's not easy. Sorry. But once they develop a solution, we will figure out what's the. What's the he so started to so, make that launch vehicle. This is different, more difficult to copy. Like you can do a copy, of course, there's plenty of fast ones. You can always, <laughs> but there is only one that has the longest. Mm -hmm. There is only one guy that has set up four high altitude balloon campaigns. There is only one meteorologist that has the experience that he has. So when 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 you are the true deal, the, the real deal, the true story, mm -hmm. there is a dynamic that people want to help. You. If you are, you know, just jumping on the bandwagon and pretending that it's your idea and it's somebody else and so on, the people that come to you are not necessarily the one that wants help. You know? So I, I, I'm not saying that that's the only protection. We have patents and we're fighting more patents. Really, you know, SpaceX is almost not patenting anything. We see people patenting stuff that is totally in the public domain, like give you an example, Blue Origin patented. Um, First stage re entering and landing on a barge in the sea. I mean, this has been around forever. Mm -hmm. There are papers about that way before they found it. If you need to do something like that, SpaceX do something like that, I'm not afraid of what happens. I don't know how to do that. So, um, there's a first mover advantage that you may have, and, and yeah, being true. And, uh, yeah, I'm probably Nyaki that is now a shareholder can help me with more uh, ideas in that respect. But I'm, you know, there's always room for several people. When I, um, when I, I fully expect people coming with something like this in the next few months. Yeah. But that, that would be validation. We look less crazy with the invention. Is your system reusable? Does it come down and not be station? Um, there is no requirement for reusability. So we break even, we do fine, it is not reusable, but we design it in thinking of it. We, that's why it has this horizontal shapes. This stage is not going to be reusable, no way. But it doesn't have to. This is nothing compared to the rest. It's very small. Um, the balloon, again, it doesn't break the loss of thermodynamics to make a balloon that is uh, reusable. So those are reusable? These two might be reusable. We would like them to be reusable. We would like them to be controllable on the way down, have them lie. They have a low center of gravity, they have a lot of surface area, high drag, which is what you want to come back to the entry. So they are pretty, if we didn't want to make them reusable, we may have done them in a different way. But we don't count it. And to be honest, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, we may start producing it, and we'll see that it's cheaper just to must produce it more than that it is to refurbish them. This is an open question. But I think learning about reusability is good. And, and, and the or choice of providing what I do in the propellant. Our choice of propellant is, is also um, pretty good for reusability. We were burning methane and oxygen, which were very cleanly. So, how about the fuel? Well, it's a rocket fuel. The rocket fuel is liquefied natural mm -hmm. gas and oxygen. Mm -hmm. It's not kerosene. Is that a typical one? Uh, methane is pretty typical. Yeah. Uh, it's super easy to work with. SpaceX is moving away from kerosene to propane as well. Sorry, methane as well. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> to, to make it glow. <laughs> no, no, we, we don't put a loom in that. Uh, I've, I've seen those things, yeah. They, they, they have some improvements sometimes, but no, no, it's just pure uh, LNG. The cool thing about LNG is there's buses in Barcelona that are going with LNG. There's, there's valves, there's components. There is so much data on combustion of liquefied natural gas. Um, a lot of people come and say, oh, there's these fancy propellants, why don't we try these? And I say, but where's the data on those propellants? I don't want to have any risk of any combustion instability that I'm not going to understand. Yeah. Are you considering a spike sign for your engine? An air spike. Mm -hmm. uh, it cannot look, look nice, right? Mm -hmm. With the tolerance already, like. 
I, I gave some thought, but there is no benefit because we are already up to, uh, adapted to high altitude. Like the main benefit of the aerospace is precisely that that it works fine at high pressures and, and low pressures. And definitely, if you're launching microsatellites, you need to do something creative, or otherwise the whole thing, the math doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. So you, you either have some airplane thing, or or if you have an aerospike, or you have an electric pump, or something funny, because otherwise, if you just try to do it a conventional way, it doesn't stay properly. Uh, yeah, I mean, it would be super cool to have like, um, like uh, some lots of little tiny things and just push all, all from the edge and have this like a giant aerospike. It's super cool. But that's low TRL, and I don't want any of that. For the moment, it's like we use all balloons. No zero. I don't want it. Yeah. You had a slide about the price per kilogram. Yeah. So I'm just trying to get a better sense of you know if you're trying to it seems like you're interested in small sats, micro sats, mid sats. You know if you're trying to launch a mesh, a constellation up there. You know you're looking at these folks from Planet Labs and, and Skybox are using you know, Russians, Russia's launch vehicles, India's launch vehicles. How, how are your prices comparing to uh, about the same as in pain, but on the orbit that I want. So you're delivering a higher altitude orbit, like higher longer, altitude less and space. the right inclination of the need. Right, not just the ISS. Yeah. So, so it's altitude and inclination time around. It's well, that yeah. precision. You can get it done. That would be fine. You can get it done. Is that for a normal price for like equatorial real? Or, or, or is it altitude and inclination right? Um, that's a great question. Because I, I love that one. It's like, I can put like 600 into it to, you know, like, put all in all. Yeah, I think, no, 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 we don't know where I'm going. I, I think this is as a sensitive story. I don't have to, to check the numbers, but I think it's a sensitive story, uh, I think. Um, so, do you find it surprising that the prices come out to be around about the same? You know, just just because like it can be much lower, lower different. That, it can be much, but because I'm not talking about cost, I'm talking about price. That's what we're ready to pay. So then, so then, just just, just we can bring down the cost significantly. Right, right now you guys are the only one of the only show what's happening. Like. Well, we're not. We have to compete with um, com concepts that are dark by for the future flights. SpaceX is probably exploring this path. SpaceX wants to send people to Mars, and that's. <laughs> I'm awesome. And yeah. oh, so they that's not exploring. Sorry? Right? Are they not really interested in space? Or I, I don't know. Uh, I don't think they are. I mean, this is this is in a different direction. It's something else. Yeah. Uh, I I I don't know. Maybe Elon Musk one day wants to find the balloon. That's not maybe. Uh, maybe rats. More like it. Yeah, we'll exchange yeah. seats, right? <laughs> so, what about a J <laughs> that's <laughs> JP Aerospace? What they, uh, they've been around, right? Oh yeah, they've been around. So, what are I, I haven't I don't follow them too closely. I read the book, which is eight years old. But what is what is? Do, do you read the book, uh, ATO? Floating airship space. to space. Yeah, yeah. Airship to orbit. Yeah, uh -huh. I haven't read it. It's good. It's really good. It's really interesting. It's very intriguing. I don't know. Um, this whole hybrid airship concept is quite intriguing. You know, uh, JP Aerospace is. They call themselves America's other space program. And, and, and they they launch as little balloons up there and they they have a concept that is basically an airship that moves from the ground and then transitions to rocket power and then start getting toward it. And I really haven't done the math and the physics, so I don't really know if it works or not. It's very nice conceptually. It would probably make a good science fiction movie, but... Yeah, in the book, I, it takes It would take several years to the Earth. I don't know. Yeah. I know that this would not be able to be funded because it would be super... Um, affordable as a... You, you, Target? Yeah, when you have to go by Russia and all sorts of things. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. So, yeah. So Google has the moon project, right? Yeah. And Africa is also, the moon is something that is getting, getting uh, in the green street. You guys have been, have been in touch with them? Like, what yeah. is the thing that they're with um, collaboration? Yeah, we've been in touch. Uh, we, they, they have some issues to get overflight permits of Spain, and uh, we're trying to help them from that. Uh, I think it's it's great. I, I, 
I think uh, balloons for communications make more sense for disaster relief situations than they do for just any kind of communications and eventually add words or neutral. Okay? Mm -hmm. To me, it's hard to, to see how you can actually you know, sustain that infrastructure for the people watching videos of cats and all that. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but I do see clearly that need for situations like Nepal or Fukushima or Australia. But I would probably do it with a much bigger balloon than the ones that they're launching and it would be a totally different thing. And I think they probably Google will be the company to do that. So we're in discussions with several tech communications companies. That actually the first company I wanted to see when I found the company was Telefonic, which is a large telecommunication company, precisely with these stories. Okay, I want to send stuff to space. The first step is a balloon. Hey, but the balloon in itself could be used for these kinds of things. And then it's a good way. We don't do sponsorships. That's what they say. But but now that Google is doing, maybe it looks fashionable. So it's yeah, I, I think that. You know, also getting, as I said, overflight rights over Russia and China is tricky. And then if you think you have the fault there, maybe you are proliferating because maybe the stuff that you are flying is other protected. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole kind of world with this idea of covering the whole world. I mean, if I were Google, I told them actually, um, if I were Google, I would do this. And I really, really wanted to do that one thing. I would say, okay, Google is one partner. Huawei in China is one partner. Bitcoin in Russia is one partner. And we get a few like that, so that we do a standard, or we distribute the launching of these balloons, and we make it like the weather balloons. Everybody, there's like a standard, and everybody launches these weather balloons, and there's no problem with the flight furniture. You, you share it, and so that the Chinese are comfortable that this is not going to be NSA, mm -hmm. and the Russians are comfortable that this is not going to be NSA. But if it's just a Google thing, like this, we're the only game in town, there's no way that it's going to apply for me. I mean, there's no precedent. precedent. So that's uh, that's like my thing, but I don't really know what I'm going to do. Just, I'm a server. Yeah. You said a couple things before. Uh, one was that there's other concepts that are delivering the users of your, of your flights. Yeah. So, so they're getting the altitude, they're getting the, you know, the, the inclinations. Um, and you also said that you can do it much cheaper than you're charging it right now. So I guess the, the question I was trying to ask before was what does it cost you guys per kilogram? <laughs> so, so, there's, there's two, so there's two questions there. One, one is like what are the other concepts? And the second is like how much should I say how much people can cost? Yeah? You don't have to tell me anything. Well, once I turn it off, it goes off. So. <laughs> I'll send you over drinks. It's <laughs> <laughs> a small sat project, you know? Sorry? Maybe I'll have some small sat projects, I don't know. Maybe if you become a deal based accelerated uh, company, we can yeah, <laughs> or whatever. It's <laughs> called your class. Yeah, but I love this. this is, isn't it beautiful? The, the space frame? Is that, is that the, yeah? Yes, the S3 one. The uh, plane as well? Yeah. That's the so same plane? It's the same plane. That's a smart. To use it for that, yeah. and you, you use it for zero gravity flights as well. Yeah. That's that's good. Uh, I, this is a Swiss, as you know, it's a Swiss space system, mm -hmm. uh, company in uh, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I was at a conference recently in, in Montreal from ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, it's part of the UN. Um, there was a gentleman from Expo, a gentleman from Bukinabati, and I was the representative of the company. And there were four people. Or to go out well from Switzerland. I think there's only four in the US. <laughs> they are not. I think, no, I, mean, I, I think there's only four S3 people in the world. But these were all oh, coming S3 from S3. Switzerland. Oh, these were right. not the American ones. They're oh, no. coming from Switzerland. And they have a parking lot with several BMW Series 6 with a logo on the door. So I know pretty well how all the companies are being funded because it's important for me, but I, this is still a, a mystery to me. It's, it's so amazing how much firepower they have, like travel budget for, for people for a little company like that. Like BMWs, when they got this, and yet they spent higher uh, it doesn't seem to well, our favorite is very good and What gets on my nerves as an engineer is the tail. I mean, the 
tell it was really scary because you see when the when the shadow was transported, they have a seven point seven, and it had like two extra tails, uh, very dark things here, so that the thing could be controlled. And the Soviets, when they transported the Buran, they had a little bigger aircraft, they had like a big tail as well. So you can't really fly this thing with this gear because these things generate processes that make this uncontrollable. So this is just gets me very nervous when I see that. <laughs> but Maybe it's like a, you know, we're going to have a Sabo and launch it and then... Uh, what? A Sabo, <laughs> like, a, a, like a slingshot that's going to send it off the uh, vehicle um, and not under rocket propulsion and then once um, it gets far enough away... Well, the plane, it ignites. I think this ignites once it drops. It shouldn't be igniting here. Yeah, it kind of like goes down, and then the lift of the thing takes it up. But in any way, this ignites, and these people here are within the blast radius of that. Okay, so just like we would be with this sort of concept. Wouldn't they roll and drop it, like the high and drop? It's on the top, and the version one, they drop it first, and it falls from 50 kilometers. Yeah, um, 50, 50, yeah. Oh, it falls a little bit. Yeah. A long time, but, it falls. but it's still... I wouldn't like to move more with me. So, in a few years, Blue Star is providing launches for like 2995, and people can get their satellite out into space. What will be the next iteration of the company to bring it to the next level? That's a good question. Um, you see, the company is not called Zero to Leo. It's not called Zero to 36 kilometers. So that gives you an idea of the intent. But it has to be sustainable. It has to make sense. Like we're not gonna, I, I don't want this to become another jobs program. You know, to, to be to enter in the just uh, okay Airbus kind of that's not what we think we're heading. There is a lot of other concepts that I have in my notebooks that I've been thinking for years. Uh, like one of them, I can tell you a little bit that I would love to try to do at some point is to is to make a drone. You see, uh, Titan Aerospace was bought by Google for a lot of money. And the economy is a drone that can't stay for five years at altitude. Mm -hmm. So that of course they haven't drawn anything like mm -hmm. that. I mean you do some mock-up and then that's graphic designer and you can get a lot of the of Microsoft, which helps. And but and and you know the, a drone that can fly for a really long time is a very interesting technical project that I, I have given some thought to. And it's a bit of like the same problem as a launcher. So you are either good near the ground or good in back or low pressure, but you can't be really good at all of that. So the same happens for you know, like the drone. If it's, you know, if there's some people pushing their hands out of a runway or something, it's not going to be a good drone up there. And if it's a good drone up there, you would probably not survive the way up. So if you take it with a balloon. Uh, a whole new dimension of designs uh, appears feasible. So that's that's something that maybe some the company will be asked to do. Like there's things of course that have a special interest, but I don't want that. That would be like as you said. Once we find out this working, and then uh, I don't know another topic that I find super interesting is electronic things. Sorry, electronic things. Uh, of course, the barriers are not there. But if they become, it's an interesting problem. And I don't think one is going to do it. Uh, I used to work for Boeing Final Works, and in my office, the team built the first uh, fuel cell airplane. So it was a hydrogen fuel cell airplane with a pilot and everything. It really was a crappy airplane, and imagine because the performance is really limited. Yeah, as a recent fuel cell drum has been obviously. Yeah, the, and, and they're looking at fuel cells for the APUs, auxiliary power units of aircraft. So there's more interesting stuff going on there. And, and I think a business jet, uh, an electric business jet, would be a pretty amazing thing to do. Um, and um, we would imagine, we would, for all these projects, you need to have very good batteries, very lightweight, especially for the human side, for, for blue. And if we imagine that we do a blue star, we do all blue, and we have a few thousand happy billionaires 
that have flown with us to space and trusted their, their lives to us. Uh, maybe they would be happy for us to make one of these for them. If, if the physics makes sense, the, the engineering is there. If the, if the batteries that are now in these labs at Stanford and MIT in these places, they actually materialize in which it's a big question. Mm -hmm. So that would be a fun thing to do also. And, and probably the network of all these folks that we are been talking to for eventual human flights would bring other business opportunities because these are interesting people. Uh, so we'll see. But that, uh, I, what I, what I don't see myself, you know, uh, just selling and then starting a new startup and then another one and another one and then people like in bioscience or in Europe. I, I, I may think, but that's not what I see myself doing. But you, want to, you don't want to do what NASA has done? Sorry? You don't want to do what NASA has done? You what has NASA done? Start something and then you know, see it go a little ways and then start something else. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would probably not be good. I mean, yeah. those things. I just know a little bit of this and, and I still and I know that I don't know uh, a lot, so I, I would not probably be a very successful with the stuff. Just really quick, what did you do at MIT? I, I did electric propulsion. Electric propulsion? Yeah, I did a, a propulsion of rockets that use electric forces to accelerate the reaction material of the, the jet. So basically what we did was, and, and it's funny because it's a, it's a fancy one, it's liquid electric propulsion. So what we have is a liquid that is made of a salt, Okay, like so the salt is positive and negative ions. So we apply an electric field to it and extract droplets of the liquid and accelerate them really far with fast with an static electrostatic field. You know, like you know like this with the pen and this attract pieces of paper. So that kind of effect, but just very strong. So we tuning the the, the voltage we could get down from one single ion to a drop. So, and then alternative, alternatively, positive and negative charge. So positive charge and negative charge, positive charge. And uh, an ion is like very small thrust, but very efficient. And a drop that is high thrust, but you run out quickly. So it's like gears. It's also different from the technology that Ellen is uh, Ellen and Safra are working on. Elwin, yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I should check it out. Uh, this is exactly what Action Systems is doing in, in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And they're actually using yeah, this bipolar like thing. Iron. And I was with them last week with Natalia. Uh, so I gave it some things on. <laughs> because that was what I was yeah, but, but not for very long. But that's what I did. Okay, so before working up, when uh, uh, Nyak suggested uh, your name to come here to speak, he shared a couple of videos. One of the videos, it was you and Richard Branson talking at this island. No, it wasn't this island. It was a common friend island. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think I put it up on the first question. So you studied at MIT, and then uh, how did you come up with the idea of bombs? And, uh, and meeting the conceptualizing um, project and then hanging out with Richard Branson. Like, uh, could you tell us a little bit about John and this? Yeah. So, let's see if I got like 5% of the battery. Oh, so wow. I know interrupts which didn't get. So, do yeah, I have a picture here of how to remember all this? Um, yeah, so this is how it came out. Oh, that's me two years old. <laughs> and that's my dad, uh, who's worked on many missions um, with the US, with Russia. He's an astronomer. So he had a probe on Huygens, uh, landed on Titan. Uh, he worked also on Rosetta, that recently landed on Comet. So, specifically for this, this idea came from a mission that was actually never funded, but we got was a point of development, it was a real sample feature. So the idea was to take a chunk of Venus and atmosphere samples and, and soil 
and take it all the way from Venus to the Earth. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that, that they could find, because Venus is a gravity well all the way from the Earth, is huge. And the density of the atmosphere is very, very dense. So, so they needed to take, make, a, well, make a Russian lander, the Russians from a land on Venus. The surface of Venus melts lead. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the electronics and everything is only, only the Russians who are doing this. So, so you, you get there, you grab your thing, and then there has to be a balloon that floats up. And then a multi stage rocket that goes from the surface of Venus into, into orbit. And, and, and then there moves with, uh, with another vehicle that then uh, will come to back to Earth and re-enter. And, and that would take uh, two big alien fives and a lot of money in the Earth. It was very risky, but that's the first time I was a teenager. And maybe so for light little satellites the earth looks like a mm -hmm. So that's where it's coming from. And um, um, this is another element for the, for the human side. So you see the body. Yeah, I need to plug it in. Um, so this is the you see the title and the date. So, I so, so this is this is actually three years before Virgin Galactic was announced. X Core was already around, and now there was the X Prize and all this, and. And from conversations with my dad and with many astronauts, I thought, well, oh, you know, what they described is actually this whole from a balloon, you might as well that to start. Um, another, uh, okay, this is, um, okay. this Where guy, is, uh, this is from a different presentation, I'm just using that oh, material. Nice. This guy here was a friend of my dad. And he discovered when Mars is right, he found water ice on the coast of Mars and, and water vapor in the atmosphere of Venus. And he all that from a high altitude balloon. And of course, we have access to the big balloons that we're using. So he put a lot of balloons to go <laughs> up style in the movie. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the coolest thing is how it came by now, because they have a timer here just to cut all of them. So this was an astronomer. <laughs> Yeah, it's hundreds of them. Hundreds of weather balloons. You know, this was when people had some and so on. So, <laughs> so I have, he passed away, my dream would have been to send him back. Yeah, he would do more pictures here, take out like a blue ball. So I knew these people and I thought, I saw that Virgin Galactic managed to raise the amount of money that they raised. I thought, well, I have another alternative solution that, you know, can fly Chinese this first thing. Uh, or that, you know, it's uh, gonna stay much longer up there. So our, um, about the grant thing, well, um, when I founded the company, I, I was naive and thinking that I think I would get funded. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but I, I, I said to myself, I'm not gonna go to space conferences, I'm gonna go to high-end tourism conferences because I don't, I know nothing about that. I knew a little bit about space, but I knew nothing about the expanding habits of the universe. And I needed to understand my client if I wanted them to be my client. So, so in one of these conferences that uh, where, where you see amazing trips and experiences, they, they are there. Your friend name is experience. You, know? you, don't, you don't buy assets by experience because that's all you take. Away, yeah? So these people would, would I remember it was in 2009, and they would sell trips to the North Pole with new arms. Or uh, you know, trips in Russia with garbage. All these, these kind of incredible experiences, and, and so I, I became friendly with a guy that has a chain that was probably the first guy to do eco friendly high end resorts. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, now it's very trendy to be eco friendly, but years ago it was like hippie, mm -hmm. he wasn't friendly, he was like no cross kind of thing. So, you know, um, this guy was like the Beginning of that revolution, his name is Sonoshi Dasani. He and his wife Eva are creating the brand. 
So we connected quickly and there were these events and uh, so we've been in an event and, and I thought he organized a week off in his island and invited a bunch of people and Branson was one. And, and so I, I got the chance to go there so we spent all this in the island. But yeah, it's um that's uh, that's how I, I actually I had met him before. Well, that's the that's the one that you saw on the on the iPad. Yeah. It's a done with Windows. I think it was, was for a uh, business school. Yeah, sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, and then well, some of the policy was kind of cold, the cold and trying to go. Just, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, this was this was when we were closing when we signed the deal. On Michael Lopez Alegria and I in the boss. Yeah. yeah, that's grand. So. He really liked what we were doing, I think, but it's very you know. Um, I don't know if we want to cut this on tape, but I think, let me, yeah, I'm going to say, um, okay. I'm very sad I that, I'm sorry? I'm very sad that, that, um, that everything's going the way it's going with that company. Um, and, and if 